was actually just me to remind her that we probably should be doing some of these things and to put them on paper and to talk about them together. You know, if someone else might say, well, we do it this way, that's a good idea or not. So none of, it, none of, none of this is necessarily the right answer. It's just what we've found works and makes us have a better sailing experience and means that we go out there probably better prepared, less chance of breakage, less chance of having a, chance of having a sad day. Um, so I'm going to take you through, there's a dozen or so pages, I'll take you through that. Rather than wait to the end for questions, if there's anything that you are unsure of as we go through, it's probably better that we stop there and resolve that. And at the end of that, let's have a conversation about other things that were good ideas. I want to change the hand. <laughs> Just um, that, that's the topic for Ben uh, in week, in week three scooter conversation. I don't think Thank we you. need to be so ambitious. Um, yes, we'll give you another point too. <laughs> <laughs> the, the judge has decided. <laughs> This is actually Paul Elstrom. It's a bit like, um, I think it's Gary Player uh, said in golf. He said, funny thing, the more I practice, um, the better I seem to, the, the better score I seem to get. So, um, Paul Elstrom said, the top sailors have all but um, one any regatta before it starts because they've prepared themselves and their boats so well. So, just think about that. I, we, we all think that they're old and fishing boats, but now we all want to win as well. So, they're probably not quite just old and fishing boats. So, um, Moose actually calls these things the one percenters, and on their own, um, they might not mean much, much, but if you add up six one percenters, that's six percent, and if we all got six percent better, we'd probably be winning more often, so, no, next one. Yeah. Um, so, even simple things on, on the boat, um, it is, firstly, it's important that the boat is ballasted correctly in terms of the amount of ballast you've got. Um, a lot of the guys here have experimented with a lot of ballast. They've experimented with, with taking maybe two or 300 kilograms out. The boat doesn't go faster, in fact, the boat goes slower and it's very tender. So get the right amount of ballast. If you're unsure of it, um, you could easily ask someone like Ray, um, the Strop Ray, who's the measurer, to say, well, could you find the, um, you know, can you meet me up at Black Arrow? Let's find the um, waterline, the design waterline of our boat and see if the boat is ballasted properly. because. The amount of ballast is quite important. It's also really important that the ballast is really in the middle of the boat. So if you found the exact centre of the boat, in, um, you know, it's a 26 footer, find the 13 foot mark, put a little tiny little mark on the side there. The, boat, the ballast really should be in the very centre of the boat. And as much as possible, stack it as close to the centre of the boat that way, and also as close to the um, plate case as well. Um, so this is an example of just Dave Curry's boat in the water um, last week. And the ballast is in three, is in three groups. It's not. Sorry, I didn't ask permission to do this. It's, it's, it's not. It's not, <laughs> it's not spread out the length of the cable at all. Um, stack the centre. Question. Yeah. Um, what about? I mean, it's one thing to have it on its lines in the marina, but how do you compensate for if you're going to have six crew in the boat or seven crew? To well, do. You've got, you've got an inch tolerance. The boat has to under the class rules. The boat has to fly with an inch of its design waterline. So you can have it right up on minimum when you load the, 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 boat, the, the boat with the crew, right, if you sit down on the waterline. I mean... Do you put a bit forward or...? Well, you, you, could be, you could be down on your design waterline, the bow, and up, up an inch to the stern. And when you trim it out with your crew weight, you, you know, that's... It really depends on the boat, I believe. There's no two boats are the same. They all have slightly different characteristics. Like some boats will be a little bit full in the bow. They may need a little more weight forward. Some boats are a little bit in the middle and may need to play it after a little bit. Really, the, the trick is with, the, with your rig, your rake, your sails and your ballast is get a boat that is has no vices going upwind. That's, that's balanced and easy to sail. By that I mean you go sailing along, get a slight tatter weather helm, get hit by a small gust, I'm not saying a big hurricane bullet, but small gust, and the helm characteristics don't change. You're not going, oh god, this thing, I can't control this when you you know, when you get a small small knockdown, or you're pushing the tiller away and you end up generating massive lure helm. If the helm changes dramatically, you've got to look at maybe your crew position, your ballast, and your recombination to get... A, a balanced boat will be a fast boat inherently. If it's not balanced, 
and you're fighting the boat all the time, that's that is really, really <laughs> bad in this boat. So it's not hard and fast rule, right? It's just get the boat, put the crew on board, get the <coughs> work, work it out and you know. We we had a good year in Rip the first year, then the second year Kim didn't put the lead in. I I think I put it in with a couple of mates. And it wasn't until the boat wasn't going real, very well for half the season. And then Nick drove the boat one day and said, This boat feels funny, it's not right. And I got Tim down, he looked at me, really cool, and said, Have a look where you got this lead. It would actually, one thing, it, and Nick is being a good helmsman, he could tell the boat felt unbalanced. Just, you know, I, I didn't know. The average weight of the lead uh, per boat, it's an individual thing? Or yes, very much. Uh, there should be. Very much, Frank. Uh, just, yeah. I mean, every, every boat is. So different in buoyancy. Like you, you look at a big, like an old, an old style 26 footer compared to the new ones they're building. They have huge big boats underneath, and they've got more volume, so they need more lead to sink them down. Well, going back 30 years ago, when, when I sailed IOR boats, we took 200 kilos out of a 40 foot boat, and it changed its characteristics significantly. It made the boat so much slower upwind. It was it was it's quite it was quite dramatic. You know, just on, and, and they're a uh, they're a big, quite a big boat, and, and the barrier was about pushing the whole lot of out of Rhapsody one year to try it, just that it was a good idea, and it was slow. Mm. And, and the reason I asked that question, Tim Phillips sailed the boat Sarah, yeah, and uh, we had 800 kilos on board, mm. and then he said you're too light. But you put 300 kilos and slowed the hell out of it. Yeah. We were very good at light winds and so forth, and so we became good at heavy winds with the extra weight, but. Quite have been removing it. I don't really. I'm only guessing. That's why I'm asking the question. I've, now I've asked. Uh, we are sailing about 900 kilos and a bit more. That's about it. But I'm still. I'm not secure or sure. What else could I do? Well, the best thing to do is to start with it, with getting it measured up to the design waterline length, which I'm not sure whether Sarah's still got its little um, little marks on the bow on transom. But if you can, the best way is to try and start there and say, all right, it is or it isn't. That's design waterline. And it might mean that it's that's that's a starting point. But that also, Frank, comes down to getting the boat so it handles nicely in, in majority conditions. It has no vices. You know, it's under ballast. It'll be horrible to sail when it's windy, and that's also is dangerous. You know, that's when you both capsize and. You know. <coughs> okay. So that's uh, lead. Um, the other thing is a, a great opportunity at the beginning of the season to, because we, you know, we all pull our boats out of the water and we chuck everything into the back of the ute uh, or the um, jeep and go, too bad a lot of shit on the boat. And, <laughs> and generally what happens is that you back the ute up again here and you put it all back on again. <laughs> well, perhaps you should be a bit more selective and say, well, we've got um, you know, six sails here. We're only ever going to use three of them. And in fact, you don't have to have one number one on the boat anyway. We're only going to use three of them. Why not leave the other three in the garage at home? And you just find that, that a whole lot of people, like a um, couple of willow meat tubs, and they fill up, up with the stuff and they throw up the bow. Well, again, it's changing the characteristics of the boat, Frank, because you've now just added another 100 kilos and you put it out of one of the you know, important parts of the boat, like right up under the, under the bow somewhere because it's out of the way. But you then unbalance the boat because you put a whole lot of weight for How many angles are allowed? This is a question because well, we've got two on board. Yeah. No, you, you've got to have, under the safety rules, you've got to have one anchor and chain. Yep. And under the CBA rules, you've also got to have a grapple anchor under the fast rules. So you've got to have two anchors under the fast rules. True. Yes. Okay. So if it'll fit your second anchor, if we went back to the shop with the lead, is you would put it down there near the centre case or, or at the base of the mast. Mm -hmm. Not in front, which I know it's easy to put in front. Mm -hmm. it's it's not, 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 not front. Because the way you hit on the deck, people don't take any notice of it. Yeah, it. Would you tolerate yeah. having a crew stand halfway between the mast and the bits and sit, sit there for the, for the duration of the race? Yeah. No, I'm serious. You put, but you do, you put a line underneath, underneath the fore deck and it's, it's out of sight. Nobody, but you wouldn't tolerate a crew person sitting up there for the duration of the race. So, yeah. Are we obliged under the rule to carry all sails? So we're obliged no. to carry one and a spitfire. Oh, yes, so you only need a one pencil and a spitfire. Yeah, yeah. And a mainsail capable of having, well, not capable, having two having having breeze reefs. Yeah, yeah, that's, cool. right. yeah that's, that's the minimum sail. Well, you don't even have to have a one on board reef. For safety reasons, you have to have a spitfire given a mainsail capable being reefed. Right. Uh, Why do you um, need a grab? Well, class rules say, it's an obscure rule, but the yeah. class rules say you need to have a, a grapnel anchor and 60 metres of rope. And as David knows, we've gone around that pretty clever way. But yeah. Yeah. The answer is you probably don't, but the rules say you do. Class rules say you need a, a grapnel anchor 
whether it's pick up your mooring or when you lose your marsh, you can anchor on a reef. I, I don't know what the rule is. What that's, that's what Kurt Boats carry. They carry grapple yeah, anchor. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. They only yeah. better the others. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, setting the prop, uh, uh, I'm sure that lots of us have around the track and got back to the mooring and gone, oh, you didn't set the prop today. Um, so make sure you've got a really easy to see line on the um, on the shaft. Um, make sure you, at some stage, while the boat's at, at mooring, look over the back and say, well, the line is in the right spot, and it is definitely looked sent. Um, incredible amount of drag. Mal Hart was saying to us um, a few weeks ago that he believes that the underwater aspect of these boats is really very important, and if you can reduce any drag at all, it's going to be quite dramatic. So setting the prop sounds like it's, you'd have to be stupid not to, but plenty of us do it, and plenty of us actually also probably set it, and it's set that way or that way, not exactly along the center line, but really critical. Um, also, down here we've found um, with the anti fowl that a lot, a lot of boats do, it seems to be a little bit about where they are, but a lot of boats do start to attract slime pretty quickly, and we've <coughs> definitely found um, with the wagtail and the rip that if you, as long as you don't sort of in the early in the season, wipe it all off because you're too aggressive with it. Um, the boat will, even though you can't, it isn't attracting green slime, it will, will in fact attract a film. And probably, you know, before the nationals, you might say, "Oh, right, I'm going to just have a dive on the boat or you know get some kids, pay some kids fifty bucks, put a um, <laughs> like a, even a, a glove on or, sponge. or a sponge, and just really lightly get that film off because it makes a dramatic difference." And same thing, under, underwater part of the boat, um, it can make a dramatic difference. Um, James found like that with his boat last year, it was attracting a huge amount of weight. So just some, some do and some don't. Um, just keep an eye. So do you say you don't have to get down with the broom and scrub it? Well, no, because you, because if you've got the soft anti fowl, which probably 80% of the boats still do, yeah. you'll end up taking it all off really quickly, mm -hmm. and then you have an anti fowl list boat, and it's going to attract the weight more quickly. So I've just found, Marie, that the... Um, just a, a soft sponge, with a soft anti fowl, a sponge will get get the slime off, mm -hmm. and also just take the small bumps off the anti fowl because that, that soft anti fowl is quite rough. And if you just, just and and it'll last the season. Yeah. You know, by the by the winter series, yes, the anti fowl is getting a bit thin, but you've got to pay the contractor to take it off anyhow. So you know, you might as well slightly wipe it off. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, are you talking just along the water line or are you talking no, no, no. the whole? The and whole. You, even, you do need whoever's doing it, um, and it's, look, it's not that particularly easy, but you do need to drop the plate and just probably wipe the leading edge of the plate as well because that attracts it. The, 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 yeah, the, the, on the leading edge, probably the front two, two to three inches, well, because sunlight still can get to that part of the centre board, you will find marine growth growing on the, on the centre board too. So you're really looking at a professional diver to do it properly, aren't you? Well, some of them do a lot of them, do. they bring it into the jetty and build the snorkels and... Mm. But you, you do need to get underneath the boat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, even, even between that period, you see a lot of boats get the scum on the waterline. That is, you know, that's not a big deal to just go around with a sponge and take that off in, in, a, in a dinghy. Yeah. Uh, but it's probably symptomatic of what's underneath the boat. Yeah. yeah. So, but it's just all the, you know, just... It does accumulate, and as you well know, too, you know, you get a boat with a lot of wood on it, it's a hell of a lot of than How regularly would you do that? <laughs> like every oh, four weeks, three weeks? Well, we, we, yeah. well, typically we do. Well, have you got somewhere who's got a scuba tank? Well, I do. Yeah, so you've got to go right there. Yeah, you've got to go right there. We wouldn't clean it. Just take it into shallow water and make it easy. Yeah, Mel's cleaning his every week, isn't he? Yeah. Well, yeah, he's probably using the ZBPC offshore. You can bring it into, yeah. you know, just the hard bed of the water. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, so James, James had uh, a hard day of any fowl in there, and he was getting me to clean his boat the same time as Wagtail, and he had 300% more growth than I did, really? than we did on Wagtail, because we were using the... the, the soft soft soft. Soft. Well, wasn't it? it was a semi-soft any right. fowl. Mm. I'd, I'd say, Bruce, if, you, if you're serious about it, you'd clean the boat for the Nationals, and you do it at least at a month in the interval for me. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah. And probably towards the end of the season, maybe if the winter series, you might try and get it done every couple of, you know, or the end of the season, you might get it done every two or three weeks. We're going to leave one of the things off the boat, we should, which is me. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, um, I know it's maybe a bit late for the boats that are in the water, but 
hopefully over the winter your contractor did um, get you to check for the top of the mast with the, um, the swages and the thimbles and the shackles. Um, there's a lot of boats out here, we saw it when we were in a rubber boat the other day, there's a lot of boats out here that get put on the mooring and they don't leave their rig tight over the week that there's not in the boat, which means the rig's flapping around like that. It means that every shackle at the top of the mast is going like this. Working, yeah. um, and uh, apart from the fact that it might, that actually the shackle might come undone, and also the, the wear and tear on it is quite dramatic. So, um, could I suggest that you really carefully make sure that when you do put the square of the boat away overnight, pull, pull the jib hazard down tight so that everything feels pretty tight, because it's really bad to see them all flogging around. Um, really sounds sound obvious again, but it's really important. Um, and as soon as you find a kink or a burr on a shroud, get it dealt with. Apart from the fact that someone's going to rip their hand open, um, you now have a stress point where something can break. The fact that one strand broken means there's probably quite a few others about to break or in a, you know, not far away. And, you know, the, the, it's a cheap, little bit of cheap insurance, but I mean, as, as we all know, if you, you lose a rig, it's time consuming and expensive to get a new mask built compared to a couple hundred dollars for a Trails. Similarly on the lashing, presumably, you know, again, you've got all your spars in the boat now, maybe your contractor put new lashings on for your side stays, <coughs> maybe you didn't. Um, using the old ones sometimes is good because you saw, you felt that you were happy with your mask break last year, so you put it back in the same spot because you can see the, um, the, the turning points on the lashings. Um, but check them that they aren't worn or you haven't just put back worn lashings that are going to be a danger point for that a month or so. Yes, in the lashing, uh, I've been wearing a kirk. I've actually put a piece of leather between the lashing and the uh, hook so that it, the leather moves with it and leaves lashing alone. Is that yeah. legal, first question? Yeah, yeah. Says, yeah. What sort of Has anybody done it before to get no. an idea if it's worked no, well? I mean, we, I've only done the last two years. Yeah. We replace our lashings every year just because, but that's a good idea, though, frankly, I mean, it's yeah. a good way of doing it. But that's, you know, if you had, a, if you had your rig nice and tight like now from the morning, yeah, you, yeah. you might get that rally movement with the sure. lashing, you know, on, on, the, on, the, on the chain plates, on the fingers, whether you... Well, the front one's weird because we don't have two tight. That's yeah, well, the lowers yeah, well, are a problem, but if they break, you're not going to lose your rig under nine sure. dollars in that condition. <laughs> Next. Can I just make a point to you? You raised the issue about the uh, fittings on top of the mast, the masthead. Um, I, I always think it's a, a good idea also with the working that goes on there with the boat on the morning all week, even tight though it may be, um, I always uh, like to think that um, it's a good idea to wire the shackles. Yeah, the mouse to shackles. Mm, uh, is that what it's called, the mouse? Mast because A, you can't get up there to tighten them or check them at any time. And if you use a bit of stainless steel wire, a copper wire, uh, just to hold the pin, to stop the pin from turning, uh, it could save you a, a nasty accident. Or even, or even a black cable tie. Yeah, yeah, black cable tie. That's what you're using in the QA. Black cable tie. 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 <laughs> the other thing is there's many good guys around here. Uh, experts are all happy to help. Even like, you know, Rimo's here most Saturdays. Um, and if you're worried about your mast break or your mast position, bring the boat to the jetty and say, hey Mark, or say Moose, could you just come and have a look for, and let them help you and say, oh, there is a bit of pre-bend, that's a good thing because then by the time I get my jib handle up, you know, the, boat, the mast's gonna be plumb. So by all means, ask some of these guys that know what they're talking about, and say, like Mark or him, to so, say, yeah, just have a look for me. Yes. Takes you five minutes, takes them five minutes, and, and then you might just get a really good piece of advice. Uh, um, Andrew, one thing moves I've found this year was the rounded shackles. Mm. Through some of those brass fittings have the round shackle, not the, yeah. the square shackle. Yes, yeah, on, on the on the PP where it attaches to the mast mm. up at the top of the mast, the, the wrong stand, the, the twisted shackles are, are flat, mm. and they they well, Mal Harvey boat's only three years old and you have to replace his mast cap, whereas the you get the Harvey mm. or Wishart. Shackles, they've got a rounded, rounded down. They're not as good quality, don't they? Those sharp edges, right? You want to go cheap? You want to go cheap? You want to go cheap? On the lowers, just the issue of the tension on lowers or lack of tension on lowers. Yeah. Just tell us. A view. 
So with respect to white bread, well, yeah. we're, we're starting our boat with, with yeah. virtually no tension on the boat, yeah. so we're, they're actually quite loose. Mm. Uh, so we can get we get a bit of forward bend, effectively. Uh, is that appropriate? Well, well, what how we set up our tail is we'll we'll go out for sail on a, you know, a nice typical sea breeze like 12 to 15 knots. Pull the pull the jeez out of the jib air, get the rig nice and tight and we'll look up the mast sideways, we'll back the lowers off so they're doing nothing, then right. we'll just snub them up so they're, they're just, just taking weight when right. we're on the wind right. so that they'll support the mast sideways. You definitely don't want, when you look up the mast, you don't want the lowers pulling too tight no. and the, and the, from the oh, lower above, the, the, okay. the, the top of the mast falling off to the lower. Because one, mm -hmm. it's probably dangerous, you know, you're creating a, a, a really sharp bend yeah. and also you're reducing the distance from the top of the mast down to the deck and you can't get as much force state tension. If you go down wind, pull the jib up tight, then you go up wind and you're bending the mast off sideways, you lose that force state okay. tension, which is, yes, Grant? If, if you've already got a, uh, the, the mast has already got a, a, an inher inter inherent bend in the mast, which Kitty Miller does, mm -hmm. is there any way we can uh, mitigate that? Which way is it bending? Back, away from back of it, slightly. You know, well, when you pull your, when you pull your jib hag on, you better, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you chop, chop it at the deck, and chop, it at the deck. chop it at the deck or at the base, push it that way. or just lock it so it's got a little, it's got a little bend like that, mm -hmm. then when you when you pull the rig, rig forward, it should just pull it in columns. Right. It'll, it'll pull the tip of the mast forward, because that's why the force day gets that big, big slack, you know, which means the rig's gone forward and that should straighten it. Mm -hmm. right. But I, I, I wouldn't be concerned if it had a small bend for a half, but it was, it was bending the other way, was bending over the bow, that that would concern me. Yeah, yeah you do not want you do, uh, uh, <coughs> you do, you do, do not want the mast leaning forward in the boat, which is what we call inverted. Mm -hmm. Yes, but yeah, sorry, back to Ross's question about the tension on the lowers. Um, sorry, um, uh, Nigel's rule of thumb was when you got the rags down, you should be able to scribe a circle about six eight inches diameter. Well, I just, I, I just, I just, well, just, just, well, we we probably get the same result. We just go. Oh, Back them off, they're doing nothing, they're just yeah. them up. So they're just, they're just taking weight, and the mast should be stay straight and falling. You now, looking at the mast sideways. That's a wind of lower. Something else that probably everybody needs to keep in mind that after a couple of races, you should look at all your lashings again and start again. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Every because they do stretch. It doesn't yeah. matter if you're using the <coughs> best stuff in the world, it still moves and tightens in or stretches or whatever. Mm -hmm. Go back and do it all again. Exactly. Well, we, mm -hmm. we did. Um, we did um, Dave's boat last week with the, with, in um, this case with the Jaboom and Moose said after they went for sale they were, the whiskers were quite loose again because it, things are just bedding in you know, all the time. even with the new season things are bedding in the lashings are new, the new lashings are stretching in that sort of stuff so you probably should do exactly what, what Barry says Would you have that bow trip pulled further up to starboard? No, so this one um, that that said, that, again, it, 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 some boats actually have a uh, direct um, straight down the middle, jib boom. Mm -hmm. This one's obviously offset. Yeah. So we went to quite a deal of care. Um, very hard to see, there's an orange string line down here. So yeah. we ran a string line from the, um, just above the foot of the mast out to the, um, yeah. right out to the end of the jaboom yeah. and made sure that that string line that ended up, by the time we finished, right down exactly the centre of the boat. Now, it's, it sounds like it's a pretty obvious thing to do, but really at the end of the jaboom here has to be in line with the mast. And it's not that difficult to do, even with the ones that are offset. Um, you know, we, we we tightened the starboard one up once we've got it there, and um, I stood up, stood on the jaboom <coughs> on, on the um, bob stay. Well, standing on the bob stay will loosen them, and then you can tighten the other one up. The I've always top. thought it was better to have it pulled up to starboard than to start. Wow. <laughs> 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 Oh, on port tack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't sail on port tack off. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going that way. Well, you're probably you're probably all your turning you, boys on the start. You're, you're probably right, Barry. The way she sails the boat, you don't sail much on port tack. You, you, you're in the eye of the wind most of the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I just uh, go back a bit from the, the point you were making about adjusting the the, uh, the cap stay, the cap stays, and the uh, lower lower yeah. stays. It's most important when you put the mast in at the beginning of the season that you make sure that the mast is standing vertically in the boat. So often, I have found, anyway, uh, when I get new cap stays made, 
that they're never the same length. Yeah. They're never exactly the same length. And if you don't set the boat up on a mast up properly, you will have it leaning one side or the other. And the way to do that is to put a bit of tension fore or aft on the mast and measure the length of these two cap stays together, pull them together. And if they're unequal, put a bit of tape on them and then measure up to the top of the tape from the deck at the chain plate to make sure you've got the mast right in the centre of the boat. And I know that last time, we just had our cap stays replaced this year and he got them pretty right, they're only about half an inch difference in length. But last year we had a, about a two inch difference in length. We had just do one for the other year. <laughs> that's, that's why. <laughs> you still want the bloody aggregate. If you've got a bit too much weather help, you can break the mask forward a bit. Uh, you, you can do that. It depends where your mask is. You don't want the mask over the bow. If you've got the mask standing upright, that way. You, know, you may, and the, another little trick a lot of people don't do is pull the centre board up a fraction. That, that reduce that move your centre of mm. lateral yeah. resistance at back a little. Oh, I'm saying, you know, just <laughs> maybe pull up six inches just to rub. Between the combination of rake and and the uh, centre board, and once again, we goes back maybe to the ba ballasting of the boat too. It might be a little bit, a little bit bowed down, and, and you know, maybe need, maybe the boat needs to be trimmed, sit a little bit flatter. Then go on. Move will crew right back up, you're not racing, you just see that gets rid of the weather on top of it. Maybe you've got to move your ballast after a little bit. You know, just, you know, it's a combination of a lot of little things mm -hmm. in the rate. Mm -hmm. uh, in travel position? Well, well, travel position, yeah, well, I mean, that's just, that's, that's next week's style trimming. I'll be isn't it? This um, lifting tackle is one that often does get, seem to get a burr in it, again, just get replaced <laughs> straight away. Also, you might find there's um, a lot of you guys have moved from wire stops on the centre plate lifting case to um, Dyneema. Um, so that's worth considering too. It's probably a little less dangerous in a lot of ways. It's less dangerous in the wire. So, and and as strong, stronger. Um, again, the end of the season, you just throw your whisker pole back in the boat. Probably you haven't. Um, Grease it or check the the beak, check that it's actually running properly, check that the string's working, that everything's working. It's obvious, but every time you may see them, no one's actually checked that it's rusted a bit over the winter. Make sure you do that. Um, check that the gas fan is in good order, and again, there's no burrs if you're using wire. It's another area where a lot of boats are now going to Dyneema instead of wire, which is um, um, better running. Um, the contractors, both of them, have been experimenting with the jaws on the um, on the uh, gaff, and they're changing the angles. And so, if you are having constant issues that you think that the sail looks really weird up there at the um, at the gaff, at where the where the gaff meets the mast, it's possibly because the jaws aren't um, either aren't sitting at the mast properly, or they're not, or they kick out. So again. Get your sail maker to have a look at it, and, say, and he'll say, "Oh, it's straight away. Oh, the jaws aren't sitting right. We need to have that dealt with." Mm -hmm. Both contractors are capable of either of re, so, re welding them so that they sit on. <coughs> um, the last one. This is the, the main, sh the uh, out main sheet out hole, the main out hole. Um, um, you get an extra purchase by some people. We used to go through the eye and then just tie it off with a bowline. But if you actually go through the clue of the sail and tie the knot down here, you're actually getting an extra purchase. Um, and again, it's pretty obvious, but, but it makes a dramatic difference to pulling the other one. Yeah, I've actually increased the uh, thing on the other side. I had trouble with it. And I didn't realise you could do that. That's the, the, the wheel, the sheath, yeah. in the, in the brown. Oh, yeah. Going back to the chores of gas, we don't have a chore, we have the bucket. That's right. And it's a bit of a bucket, in one time, uh, one, uh, these uh, poor tax, you know, we lies down, and start with tax, and tilt sort of the shit out of And literally, I don't know how to adjust it. Well, the way to adjust it would be to replace it as a right? Yeah, the way to I dropped mine off. We dropped those off. I changed mine. You can have it. Up the most. Yeah. 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 Yeah
but until we, until we went to the hill, we, we went out to work out. There's no wrong or reason why they kicked the one side yeah. or do that. They just, they just, I thought they were just a horrible device. That's why nobody has them in one side. So everyone's clear on how to do that? Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, when we when we uh, started with a lot of the old boats, and of course you know Moose is helping some people rewrite the boats. Many of the boats um, have got halyards and sheets that are way too thick for their use, um, and it's obvious you know it's a double braid, and I think the double braid when it's two or three years old, the double braid actually has swollen to be even thicker than it was when it was when it was ten mil. It's probably actually now twelve mil double braid, just the way it's swollen. You've got to make sure that all these halyards and sheets will run more freely through their blocks. And the best way to do that is to probably go down a gauge almost on everything. Um, and it, you'll find that even though you might say, oh, it's harder on my hands, it's actually not harder on your hands because it's going to run through the block more freely. So the, whatever you're losing, by, you think you <coughs> might be a bit tougher on your hands, you're gaining by it being easier to run through the blocks quite dramatically. Um, hopefully you did wash them all um, over the winter and that they're nice and soft. Um, with the blocks, um, Graham was you were saying that you must not wash them in. Oh, well, both manufacturer recommend just fresh water. No fresh water. No <laughs> oils. No lubricants. <laughs> I, I just use a little soap. Yeah, well, both the major manufacturers to say yeah. do not put grease oil on the blocks. It's not. And they, it's uh, yeah, but just dose them with fresh water. So Moose said, you know, when, when you finish your race, generally we've all got half full bottles of water lying around the boat. And tip the water on the blocks and just run, run over the bottom, tip it over the side. Just pull your, you, you can please ratchet blocks all your expensive hardware. Pull, pull a bit of fresh water if you can't see here. Just grab a bucket of water and you're going to wash it again. Um, and again, just looking at these blocks, most the, the jib sheet turning block on the deck is a is a critical block for um, ease of use and for safety. And you should have a, some sort of a ratchet block there, and it should be on in the in the right position. And similarly with the main sheet block, block the very last block before the cleat, it should be a ratchet block. Again, Ronstan had one, um, the, and so does uh, the, the other manufacturer. So it's an expensive investment, but it's very well worth it for safety and ease of use. Mm. Both, both use auto, auto ratchets, which mean they they'll engage and ratchet on the load, and when you're easing the weather jib sheet, they just turn into a roll bearing block, which mm. makes you're not fighting that weather sheet when you let it go. You're only you're only fighting people's feet standing on. You're not pulling against a ratchet block. <coughs> <coughs> Andy, just jumping back to the, the rope, um, the main sheet. What, what sort of rope? What sort of size? Well, on the, on the 26 footers, we're using eight, and where the load, on that last three or four metres where the load comes into it, when you're pulling it to go on the wind, on the, on the stuff I do, I'll put about four metre, ten mil speed over the eight mil. So that lasts, when you're pulling that oh, last little that's wind, how he does it. Yeah. set up here, ah. the last bit of the ten mil will be, go for the first block. I thought he used boom. different ropes. Like, no. In the cockpit, forcing it down, he's still got still got the full 10 mil and the guy up on the gun has got the 10 mil mm -hmm. when you crack the piece of sheet the tight region you've still got the 10 mil to play with and once you're once you're going down with you've got the 8 mil and the 8 mil you've got no double break whatever you like i mean i we probably we probably use dynamic because it soaks up less water so in the light moderate areas when you're going down with the main sheet's a little bit wider and, and it'll stay out on its own accord yeah. but and you can get it easy to take a double break on as well yeah yeah, yeah. Um, when you do set the boat up for racing, it's, and we do all have change of crew, we have different people doing stuff, I know we've got some regular people, but it's really important, just get a piece of electrical tape or some, some sort of tape, wrap around the mast here, and when you get your ideal position, you might end up with, you know, you might end up with black, blue, and red, or you might just say, well, I've got one piece of tape here, which is my ideal position on my luff and my ideal position on my gaff, mm -hmm. and make sure you mark them where you think they're about right, and then at least the helmsman can look forward. You go, the main does not look, look much good. He can look straight up and you see the, and say, you haven't got the gaff up enough because you can see it from here as well. So try and put a plan there, and then mark the all three halyards the jib had it as well 
Um, and also, we always put tracking stitches on all three headlands. Doesn't matter if it, even if it's like light airs, you still put the tracking stitch in. You never know the wind's going to come up. It just makes it so much easier to put them on. So you've got, you, for instance, most boats have a three-one jib head. You put your three-one tracking stitch in. You've got an effective nine-to-one purchase. Same with the peak and throat head. So with the peak and throat heads, what can be a two-man job if it's a three-one head becomes a one-man job. So if you want to adjust going up wind, means one guy gets off the rail and can do it on his own rather than getting two guys off and turning into a you know, a surface. So it just makes it quick. And just makes it quick. And also a lot of tension on your main source because it just helps the whole thing. And if you find you're having difficulty with the input, a lot of crews we started off uh, it used to be a rule that you had to leave the horse uh, adjustment at the transom. And then after quite a lot of discussion, we thought that's actually quite dangerous because there's people leaning back behind the helmsman to, to, to try and get the horse, get the traveller back up. So we allow people to run it forward. Uh, if you're now finding that, or your crew saying, this is in a really shit position, or this is really difficult, or there's a, if you're getting that sort of feedback, you go, well, they're constantly complaining to me about where this cleat is or where this block is. Go and have a look on another couple of boats and see where they're doing. Because some people are still wanting to do that um, horse adjustment from Lewin. We found it doesn't work for us that way. We've uh, run it around a different way so that we can do it from weather and you can turn that way and do it. You're not getting anybody's way. Different people have different preferences. But if you are getting feedback from the crew that something's not in the right position, do something about it. Don't make them have the sads all season. Not that difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew and Moose, we, Jeff and I went up this year to the um, races up in Sydney and Pitwater. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and they have a wonderful system up there which is, that isn't here for the mast. Yeah. The Handy Billy system, mm -hmm. is that the name of it? Where yeah. they have the jib halyard and they have the peak and it goes through the deck yeah. and the pulley system is under the deck and you have one person standing on the floor. Yeah. So you mm -hmm. still get the leverage of the truckies knots. Currently illegal. But it's very good. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, and for safety, it is much better than someone hopping off the deck to try to, to get the leverage like that, particularly in the boat. Definitely a question for the Cuda Boat Association. So and, I think it and, should be considered. But right now it's illegal. All right, and but it would be good. Yep. No, I think this is the average age over 50. And, and the CBA don't have to make a decision for the company coming down. <laughs> Interstate boats comply with our rules, or we relax our rules to, yeah. to, to allow them. That's, yeah. that's it's something that we So yeah. that's yeah. something to see. That's a CBA thing. So I'd like to seriously think about that. How they're going to police that? Otherwise, you know, there'll be protest city up there over that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah. No, I fully agree, right? Really. Yeah. But well, it is. It is. There's yeah, a lot of well, things that could be improved. Yes. You know, it actually it's fine, a fine on the main streets and you know, there's no question the whole system would be improved. <laughs> You know, we've got the best what's legal under the past rules. Yeah. It certainly is, if, if you said one of the objectives of the CBA should be to make the things easy to sail, that's definitely something you should be considered. Yeah, it's safety. So I think it's in there. Um, look, again, it sounds obvious, but it's, it's, if you've got a marker on board, the, the jib car position when racing, and again, um, probably Rimo will cover this um, next week, but the jib car position when racing is really quite critical. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's no big deal to um, put a, um, some marks on the deck just with a text to pen that says, you know, three, four, five, six, whatever that doesn't matter. And you'll get to know that in 15 knots with, uh, with no chop, that we should be at five. And uh, with 15 knots with the, normally with a lot of chop, we need to be at, um, at three because we're trying to get a bit more. You know, it it's, 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 takes a while to know which one it is, but. You're never going to do it unless, if you're just constantly saying, how many holes are showing at the back? Well, that's so much easier for that. Um, Toolkit, um, I think someone said, Ben was it telling us, make sure you've got a really good knife on the boat. You never know when you're going to need a, a knife for something if there's a, a catastrophic event. Make sure you've got a good knife on the, on the boat. Um, it's, you know, make sure that you have um, some spare shackles, some spare twine or Dyneema, probably better to get a few lengths of something so that, like Dyneema, so that you know if you have to fix something in a hurry, you've got something really strong to fix it. Mm -hmm. 
Which level one you want now? There's about 15 different varieties. Well, well, what well, 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 if you want to spend $400 on a titanium one, frankly, no, 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 the original is fantastic. $100 stainless steel one, and that's up to you. You want one with a little fold to do your nails? A lot of us have still got the old brass thing to unscrew for this. Maybe one day, this year, next year, you're probably better off to go to the pull button. Or an old knob, get the get get the bolt in place with the nail knobs, you don't have to find the, the spanner to undo the thing, and yeah. also make sure the holes are all drilled nice and big, so you're not trying to precisely line them up, and the car slide easily on the tracks, you're not having to kick the shit out of them every time you want to cut them. Yeah, because we're about to tell you next week, I'm sure you need a feed adjustment on that. Yeah. And, and, a, and a big range, like, for instance, I'm surprised between a light day and wet tail, on, on a light day and and a day where they pull it off, we probably move the cars in excess of 15 inches. Which is a lot of movement, but that's what it is. It's just an open view button, you know, whether, whether we want it right or wrong, Max, it's funny, that's what we do. Um, if you've got new sales, uh, main or jib or both, you need to let uh, Drew and or Ben know um, there is a handicap penalty for the new gear um, each year, and you need to know the fine right away, otherwise you'll find some Smarty will put in a protest um, very quickly, so make sure you notify them and try to look after them. Um, the sales, apart from the fact that they cost a lot of money, um, if, if you're not <coughs> looking after them when you're pulling them up, putting them down, scoring them away, um, you're going to reduce the life of them. We find a lot of people, we see a lot of people out here pulling their headsails up with the bulkhead to wind. It's a really dumb way to pull the headsail up. The best way to pull the headsail up is to run the boat downwind and you're pulling the headsail up in the lee of the main. It just makes so much easier. It's not, you know, flapping around madly. No one's going to get hurt. It's just a far better way to pull it up and pull it down. Or just run down wind, drop it down in the lee of the main, then start away. And try not to, when you, when you lower the jib, all the crew just grab the sheet and pull it underneath the boom. You get a brand new yarn temper sail and just scrunch it 90 degrees under the boom. Let, let the sheets go, let the heater go. Float the tack off and just bring it around the weather side and just gently pass it down the weather side of the cockpit so you're not. You see that many people scrunching it up? Yeah, yeah. The people can grab it under the boom and there's not a lot of clearance under there and it just destroys. Well, nothing, nothing destroys the yarn tempered sail more than. Yeah, we'll just. Mm. Battens is obvious, but when you do square the boat away overnight, make sure that you flake the main in such a way that when, you, when you're about to put the sail ties around, that one of the battens isn't like kinked out because they do have memory and then the next week you use it, the baton's going to have a kink in it up the boat. So just back into that. The baton has to be twisted and the mains are one set properly and you're going, you know, what's happening? Yeah, I noticed the sail makers have changed their method of uh, retaining the batons in the sails now. The new sail I've got this year, which will make it much easier to take the batons in there. Well, different sail makers have different methods, yeah. <laughs> and that's the secret too. If it's made easy to get them in and out, you at least could take the top one out before you sail. Yeah, we've, 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 we've spoken to we've spoken to the other other sail makers about that too. Um, obviously, we've got less protestable events. Uh,